up, family, and welcome back to another uh, segment of Bible study with an ex-pastor. Um, we've been doing this for a few weeks now, and wow, this is this has just been incredible. I am actually toying with the idea of doing these fully live. Now, for those of you who haven't caught on yet, these are typically pre-recorded so that I can engage with you in the premium chat because at times that I let this go, I'm typically at work and I can't be recording at those times, right? But uh, but I am thinking about maybe doing a few of these live or may maybe once a month doing one live or maybe at the end of every, at the end of every uh, book doing one live. So we'll see. Um, and of course, today we're going to be jumping into Genesis chapter 25. We left off in Genesis chapter 24 uh, last week. And so we're going to pick right up where we left off in 25. Um, and for those of you who may be new to this, this isn't necessarily a theological dive, um, a theological deep dive, nor is this, you know, I'm not going to be fixing everything you, you thought were wrong with scripture or anything like that. Um, in this, I'm just going to be sharing with you some things that I thought when I was in the faith and some things that I think about these things now. So it has been a wild ride so far, and I'm glad that you're on it with us. Before we jump in, you know the deal. Make sure that you like the video if you haven't already. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the alert, uh, the alert notification bell so you can get notified. Um, also, um, hey, check out our merchandise. We have some of that. Consider joining our Patreon or our YouTube membership program or both, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, consider volunteering. We have a volunteer form on our website, dldd.us. Um, we're looking for people to help us just with the community. And so uh, it's not like you have to go anywhere. You can do it all from the comfort of your own home. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think it's more than a five five hour commitment, you know, type of thing per week type of situation. But yeah, um, definitely take a look at that. All right. So I think I got all of that done. Let's kind of jump into our text today. And again, we're looking at Genesis chapter 25. We're still in Abram's and uh, Abraham's family. Um, well, I guess the whole Old Testament is kind of Abraham's family, right? right? And then how it's supposed to be. Um, but so Genesis chapter 25, verse one, this starts with Abraham's death now. Well, or this section is called Abraham's death here. Um, so now Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah, which I actually knew a young lady named Keturah. Why well, I call her young lady? She was older than me. Um, but she bore to him Zimran, Jokshim, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshim fathered Sheba in Dadan. And the sons of Dedan were Ashurim, Letishim, and Luimim. The sons of Midian were Ephath, Epher, which that, 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 that name is repeated quite a bit, Epher is, uh, Hanak, Abida, and Elda'a. All of these were the sons of Keturah. Now Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living and sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of, of the east. All right, so Keturah, which I've actually done some teaching on Keturah before, and this was back in the day. Now, I don't actually know if any of that teaching was accurate, right? Uh, because what I what I've learned since then is that like Oh snap! A lot of Christian theologians are really disingenuous when it become, when it comes to the way that they interpret the Old Testament, and most of them are pulling from places that are not actually um, bound in, in any type of academia. But uh, but that's because revelation is a thing, right? And 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 and, and as far as preachers, you know what I'm saying? God, especially black preachers, God gives you revelation of the text. And so, like, I don't think I don't think it wasn't until after becoming an atheist that I realized how disingenuous revelation is. This idea that oh, no, God revealed to me this is who this person really was. So you don't even have to get familiar with the cultural context of the story at all. You just get to make it up as you go along, um, which, you know, I guess is fair. All's fair in fiction. Right. You know, so I don't know. But but it, 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 I definitely had a lot of. Um, I, I, I had a lot of thoughts on Katora because she was a she was a wife of Abram that I didn't uh, Abraham that I didn't hear a lot of people talk about. Like, hey, wh wh where was this lady? Um, and then 
Katura, based on, uh, and I can't remember what, what, why I thought this, but I had come to the conclusion that Katura was not only, you know, Abraham's, you know, next wife, but she was also black. So it's like after, after Abraham had got him a little piece of Hagar, he couldn't just stop. You know, it's like they say, once you go black, you never go back, right? And so uh, Abraham apparently has that same type of uh, situation, and and I think I think what may have led me to that to that route are the place names of her sons, you know, and so um, you, you can obviously tell in scripture when, 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 when the names of children are place names. And so these are place names, Sheba, Dedan, uh, Midian, these are place names. And so what we're doing in this case is we're ultimately trying to create the origin story of these people in the East. All right. Now, if you're in the Middle East, which I still laugh about hearing that because like that just makes no sense. Like Middle East, what? 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 But no, but if you're in the Middle East, then what's east of you? Unless I'm doing my compass wrong in my head, I think what's east of you is East Africa. Well, West Africa too. But Africa, period, you know? Um, so that's what this seemed to be doing to me at, at one point of time, you know. Um, and again, so Abraham, he, he got a little black meat with Hagar. And then, you know, he was like, shoot, Sarah gone now, bruh, bruh, let me go ahead and go back down there. And, and apparently that's what he does. But then he still has this thing. And, and you know, the wording of the Bible was always weird to me, you know, uh, and, and until I realized, okay, you know, now that I can kind of look at it as fiction and as art and things of that nature, then I'm like, oh, okay, I kind of. I, I can kind of give it credence for some things, but like this right here, now Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, all, like all is a word. It, it has, it, like somebody said in, in one of our chats, words have meaning, words have definite, you know, definitions and all means all. And so he said, now Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding like what he gave all that he had to Isaac, but that he, but he gave some gifts to his son. Either, either you lying. Uh oh, why did my page switch? Okay. I don't know what happened there, but either you're lying or, or somebody doesn't know what all means, you know, like, and maybe I, it could be lying because Abraham so far does not get father of the year, right? Like he completely abandoned Ishmael. True story, like kick, kick dude and his mama out of the house and said, y'all got to go on somewhere. I give you some money. But that that's a, that's child abandonment. Right. Uh, that, that's also spousal neglect at that at that moment or that moment, too, even though they probably don't consider her a spouse. But still, um, oh, I got to come back to the Couture thing in a few. But so and then, then, then he, he tries to kill Isaac, you know, on a dare, basically. And, 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 and then and now these other kids, he's like, hey. Uh, I'm going to have to send y'all away too. You know, he's like, you know, how some men are like one women men. Abraham is like a one child man. You know, I'm just a one child man, you know, can't have more than one. That's just to, you know, and actually I think I knew, I know some brothers like that. Um, so, so I thought this was odd. Okay. The Keturah thing, right? One of the things that I actually believed at one point, and I, and, it, and it's crazy. I actually believed that Keturah was Hagar. I believed that at one point. And, and, and I don't know that, that um, it may, I'm, I'm almost positive it's something that I read because I wasn't the revelation type of preacher. Uh, I did like to read and I like to find out things. But unfortunately, during those times in my life, I was definitely the type of preacher who was like, well, if another preacher says this, it must be true because obviously they wouldn't lie. I was definitely that way for a while. Well, not that long, because after a while, it became very clear that, yes, they will lie. Like, that's why we didn't do testimony services uh, in my church, because I believed that, yeah, people lie. Yeah, so we're not going to do that anymore. But, yeah, I figured that at one point that that possibly that uh, after Sarah died, Abra Abraham went out to find Hagar, you know, and, and she was off living possibly with with the people that she had came from, because th there are some texts that suggested that Hagar was a princess at one point. And so I was 
possibly thinking that this Hagar name was her uh, Abraham given name. You know, people like to rename their slaves and shit. Um, and then uh, Keturah was possibly her indigenous name, her given name. Since she had, since she was living as a free woman this time, her and Abraham gets together. She, she, you know, goes by Keturah. Oh man, I could have made just a wonderfully beautiful, sadistic love story out of that. I mean, because that's the only way that twist goes. Um, you know, but you also see here that to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living and then sent them away from his son. You know, so I don't know if this concubines is just referencing Hagar in the past tense and Keturah in the present tense is saying these, these are the only two concubines uh, Abraham had, or if, if the, the particular author who some people believe is Moses is trying to let us know that Abraham had quite a few concubines because I'm concubines. That sounds so funny. Concubines. Um, and that he had ran this gambit a few times. And that was really what he was trying to get. Abraham was out here just trying to get concubines like much other than men of his time. He was just trying to get booty. All right, so these are all the years of Abraham's life that he lived, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died at a good old age, an old man and satisfied with life, and he was gathered to his people. I bet he was satisfied, sick son of a bitch. I bet he was. Um, yeah, I'm not a fan of Abraham. I, I am not a fan of Abraham. I don't like the way he treats his kids. I don't like the way he treats his women. I don't like the way he treats strangers. Like, this is not a good guy. Like, what? Um, so then his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite facing Mamre. And so I'm guessing because we all saw when when he sent uh, when he sent Ishmael away. I'm, I'm guessing they had some powerful communication strategies back then to, so that Ishmael was able to make it back in time for the funeral. That's interesting to me. Um, and, and, I, and I think it's those type of things that do let you know, like, oh, yeah, this isn't true. This is trying to tell something else. This is this is not trying to tell a true story, per se. This is not trying to tell a historical story. This is this is fable. You know, someone said uh, fabulous be fabulating. You know what I'm saying? This is this is this is these are fables. These are mythologies. This is like a a Aesop. Y'all remember Aesop, right? Aesop, 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 you know, whichever one. Um Oh, that reminds me of a Barney song. I don't know why. Maybe I'll remember it. Um, so, and they buried him in the cave, you know. There's that cave thing. The field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth, there Abraham was buried with his wife, Sarah. Yep. That was the, uh, the field that he got that steep discount off of by pretending to be broke when he was rich. You know, Abraham, tell you, he's not a good guy. Like, he's not a good guy. It came about after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac lived by that place, Beer Lai Laha Rohi. Rohi. I kind of want to see what that means, but then I, I won't get through the chapter. Hey, you, you, you see the website that I'm using, Blue Letter Bible? You can go check it out. You click tools, you can see what any word means, and I use that word loosely. All right, so now these are the records of the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's slave woman. You see that? That is just so disrespectful. Like this, you know, this woman is no longer anybody's slave. She's been released. Why are we still talking about her that way? That's so disrespectful. Um, let, I'm going to reread this. Uh, now, these are the records of the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, the woman who was better than Sarah on her worst day, bore to Abraham. That sounds much better to me. Um, and actually, I don't know anything about Hagar to be over glorifying her like that. But, you know, I know enough about Sarah to know that she sucks in every sense of the word. All right. She was married to Abraham. I mean, shouldn't that say enough? And I just found out recently, I have to go watch the video to clarify, but I think Dr. Bird has brought to attention that Abraham and Sarah were not half brothers and sisters. They were fully related. Ooh, I can't wait to watch that, by the way. All right. So, dun -dun -dun -dun. 
Uh, and these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names in order of their birth. Neboath, the firstborn of Ishmael. Kedar, that is a that is a place name. How do you know that's a place name? Because later on in the book of Solomon, I believe, uh, in the songs of Solomon, I believe, there is a moment where they reference the tents of Kedar. All right. Abdil, Mibsam, Misma, Duma, Masa. I don't like that Masa word. Now we're going we're gonna to stop playing games with me. Hadad, Tima, Jatur, Nafish, and Kadima or Kadema. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their camps. Twelve princes according to their tribes. Isn't it interesting that Ishmael has twelve princes and Israel later have twelve princes? And that those moments, you know, those type of things don't actually happen in real life. So when you see those type of coincidences, these are these are hints that this is fiction. You know, that that's 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 literally how that works, you know. Um, like when you see the same number over and over again repeated, there were 12 uh, tribes of Israel, there were 12 disciples, there, you know, 12 blue moons, and I don't know, but you know, like that's fiction. Like, yikes, how do we not, how did we not see that? Like, no, nothing, who has exactly 12 friends? Come on now. All right, so these are the sons of Ishmael, yeah. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. Yeah, and he breathed his last and died. And thankfully, it's about time, right? I like. I feel like everybody over there just breathed like, yes, the psychopath is gone. Like, man, like, would you want your kids to be around the guy that almost killed his kid? That's, that's not, you don't want to live in that neighborhood no more. So, of course, when that guy dies, you're like, yes. It's like the end of the Wizard of Oz, you know, ding dong, the witch is dead. So, like, I want to rewrite this story now where Abraham and Sarah are like terrorists and they're like terrorizing these people with their diseases and stuff. I I, I might write it. Don't tempt me. I'm an author. So um, these are the years of the life of Ishmael. 137, he breathed his life and he died and was gathered to his people. Uh, they settled from Havila to Shur, which is, why am I, uh, Ishmael wasn't the bad guy, it was his daddy. Um, and he breathed his last and, last and died and was gathered to his people. That's the same thing they said about Abraham. I don't know what gathered to his people means. Like, who is his people? Are you talking about his family, his extended family? Because at this moment, it seems like everybody's family, because you know why. But, um, all right, so now we're going to, oh, so like, and then. They settled from Havila to Shur, which is east of Egypt. Wait a minute. East of Egypt, going toward Assyria. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. That makes sense. Okay. Settled in defiance of all of all his relatives. Yeah, that's east. That's east. That Yeah, I have to rethink that. Okay. That is very odd now. Oh, but I remember, I remember thinking through that, um, there was this, okay. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm having an inside thought here because earlier I was talking about the, the people being sent East from the middle East. And I was talking about Africa and it's like, no, that's Asia <laughs> East from the middle East is Asia. So uh, at one point when I was on this fringe binge and it was like, but East is Africa. It was because there was this, um, uh, uh, in ancient Egypt. There is a disorientation, if you will, between Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt because it's based off of the Nile, not the. Uh, it's based off of the way the Nile flows, and so at one point it flows one way, another way point it flows another way. So Lower Egypt is is actually what we would consider northern, and and Upper Egypt is what we consider lower. It's, it was something like that, and so there were, there was someone else. There was another theologian who had suggested that the Middle Eastern worldview was actually upside down. So that east is west and north is actually south. You know, I, I did soon realize that that was a bunch of bullshit. But but it was it was fun bullshit for a while. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, I love it. Like I, you know, I, I like the liberties of fiction. The, the, the more that I re the more that I was able to realize that this was fiction, um, I no longer felt bad for any of the fringe theories I had because then it's like, oh, that's just my own fan fiction, and I can write it in any ways I want to. Apparently, I mean, if Joseph Smith can do it, I can too, right? So now these are the records of the generations of Isaac. And he's going to get a longer story. You see, Ishmael's story got truncated, you know. 
But uh, Isaac gets a little longer story. Um, uh, Abraham's son, Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebecca. You see how they word that? Like, what? Just took her, huh? Took Rebecca, the daughter of Bethuel, the, the Aramean, of Paran Aram, the sister of Laban. Man, they're giving me a lot of information. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children, and the Lord answered him, and his wife, Rebecca, conceived. But the children struggled together with her, and she said, If it is so, why am I in this condition? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two people will be separated from your body, and one people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. Okay. So I want to stop right here because I, I started reading that in preacher voice. And then as I was reading it in preacher voice, I realized like in the church world specifically, you know, I'll say urban church. Sometimes I say black church, but it's not just restricted to the black church uh, in the urban church, which includes churches like Stephen Furtick and folk like that. In the urban church, you know, I could have preached something like this and everybody would have been like, yeah, oh, my God, two nations in my womb. But I'm like, like, literally thinking if you had never had the presupposition and you don't know in advance that he's just saying she's pregnant with twins. Let's assume you don't know that you don't know that, you know, and at this moment, I don't I can't remember if there have been any twins yet, but you don't know that he's just saying you're pregnant with, with two kids. This person just told you there are two entire nations in your womb and then goes on to say that there are two peoples who will be separated from your body. Not two people, two peoples. That's two people groups. For those of you who don't know shorthand, that's two people groups. Like, wouldn't that freak like what the freak? Like, basically, he just told you, hey, you're you're pregnant with 200,000 people. Like, no, that, that's terrifying because I'm thinking that's what Sarah has to be thinking. But of course, that's not because this is just artsy stuff right here. Two nations are in your womb. Like, it feels really deep and overwhelming. It makes you feel like, ooh, I'm important, you know. Um, but but when you actually think about these words, they're, they're actually very creepy. Two nations. I don't want to have that many children at one time. Like, God, leave. And, and I guess even when it comes down to like just being two kids, it's still a little creepy. It's like, what? Why? I wasn't even trying for one. How did I get two? You know, so, the, you know, two nations are in your womb. Another thing I wanted to point out here is, though, like, why is everybody, why is everybody in this family barren at first? You know? And so, like, there's another way to look at these stories, and, I, and it is fringe, and that is to realize that these people are actually the bad guys trying to rewrite themselves as the good guys. Because remember what they said about Egypt? They said God had cursed the women to be barren. And remember how we realized that that made no sense because Abraham and Sarah were not there long enough to be able to tell if any of the women were barren or not? But maybe... They were revealing something about themselves because so far that is very common. Remember, Sarah was barren. That's why we needed Hagar. And then Rebecca, because she comes from the same family that both Abraham and Sarah comes from, which means that she is related to her husband on both sides. I mean, it's bad enough to be related to your husband on one side, but both sides. God damn. Y'all just nasty. All right. So. So yeah, I did find that odd. That that, but but now it does make sense why everybody in this family is barren. Ah, because that is that is one of one of the one of the potential side effects of close incest, infertility. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's very very interesting. All right. So. So when her day, when her days leading to the delivery were at an end, behold, there were twins in her womb. I bet you she was so relieved. It's just two. Okay, it's just two people, not two nations. So you ain't got to pull nobody else out of there. Oh, God. Yeah. Th this lady, Rebecca, was probably like, oh, thank you so much. Uh, the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. And uh, for, for many years, I thought Esau was black, you know. Um, and, and mind you, 
Esau was black when it was convenient for some of my white Christian counterparts. So when it was convenient, oh yeah, this is why he's cursed. Yeah, it's Esau. All, all the ones that look different. But then when, you, when, when, when black people start trying to put themselves in the Bible and say, oh, we're Esau, then all of a sudden the white theologians, that's not what red means. I don't know if you can see me very well. But like literally the majority of my bloodline is African and there's quite a bit of red in my tent. All right. Quite, quite a bit of red. As a matter of fact, in, 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 in a lot of ancient linguistics, there is no distinction between red and brown. I just want to make that clear. And even today, there, there are parts of Africa that, 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 have, that have not actually been uh, there. And I'm talking about I'm, tribes of Africa that have not been integrated, such as the sand folk who are red. So much like me. So it was feasible. But when it was convenient for for some of my white theologian friends to because Esau is like the cursed one to say, oh, yeah, yeah, he, he's the blacker tribes. It's convenient. You use it. But then when black folks start saying, yeah, we're in the Bible, we're actually Esau. And it's like, no, that's not what red means. And it's like, well, at the end of the day, we're all kind of red. You actually pay attention to the human coloration scheme. There's red within all of us because we all have blood. Eh? Eh? You know, I'm, ju I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But yeah, at one point I was definitely convinced that, that Esau was black. And at first I was convinced it was a bad thing. And then I was convinced it was a good thing. And then I was convinced like, hey, these people don't exist. So it doesn't even fucking matter. And even if they did exist, it still wouldn't fucking matter. If, like, if Esau was black or white or polka dotted back then, it, it has no nothing to do with my life at all. I don't know this dude. All right? Just want to make that clear. I don't know the man. Quoting Peter there, for those of you who caught it. All right. So afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding on to Esau's heels. So he was named Jacob, and Isaac was 60 years old when he gave birth to them. Wow. I'm not trying to be an ageist, but I did grow up in a, in, a, in a small city where I've seen what happens when old men have kids. It's sometimes scary. And so this now makes me reimagine Jacob and Esau. And it's probably why Esau, uh, Jacob had hip problems so early, you know? Um, so when, when the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a civilized man, living in tents. What? what? Okay. That can't be what that word says. Like, wait a minute. Oh, that's even worse. Complete. Do, do, do y'all see that? Like, holy snap. And, 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 I, and, and this may be some of the reason why some of the wider theologians justified this idea of, of Esau being the darker people, other than the text making it clear that he's red, you know, and, I, you know, and, and, and let's say if they're supposed to be Jews, I don't know how many red headed Jews, you know, you know what I'm saying? Um, but like Esau, skillful hunter, man of the field. But Jacob was a civilized man. And, or the footnote is a complete man. Now, and these are twins. And it's very odd to me. And it's basically just that, you know, one is a savage. And it, it, this is like Pocahontas. Savages, savages, barely even human. Like, this is, like, what the, what? I don't, I don't think I, well, I must have, but I don't remember reading that that way. And, and, uh, and well, I am in the New American Standard Bible, and I, I wouldn't have went back and read this story in the New American Standard, Standard Bible because I don't, I don't, I did preach Jacob though, but I never preached Jacob and Esau. I did preach Jacob though. But that's just interesting that that this is here. Jacob is a civilized man. And then, but like if 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 the sentence ended there, it would it would be bad, right? If Jacob was a civilized man. Because it's like, oh, your brother's a skillful hunter, which I thought was a compliment at first, you know? Like, yeah, like, th if this isn't a loaded compliment, yeah, your bro you're a skillful hunter and a man of the field, but Jacob is a civilized man. But then, living in tents. And I'm like, what? Like, like, at this time, at this time period, at the time period that Jacob and Esau are to allegedly live, there are, like, stone buildings. 
There are pyramids that exist, for Christ's sake. And Jacob is a civilized man living in tents, which, which I find odd because remember, Paul is also a tent maker at a time where there are stone buildings. Like, yikes. Dang. Wow. Wow. Mm -mm. That doesn't make sense. That does not make sense. There were stone buildings. What? Why were you making tents and not making buildings? You chose the wrong career, sir. All right. But but anyway, so so he's living in tents. And that I don't think I've, I've ever caught that. And why, why would he be living somewhere differently than his brother? Like, so so is Esau not living in tents? Why are they not telling us where Esau living? But, you know, kind of like Ishmael, Esau is supposed to be just a wild man. Now, Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for gain. But Rebecca loved Jacob. Hmm. Okay. Okay. We, we already see signs of these two people not being great parents. You know. <sighs> when Jacob had cooked the stew one day, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a mouthful of that red stuff there, for I am exhausted. Therefore, he was called Edom by name. That's where the Edomites are very important to the Hebrew Israelites for whatever reason. They are constantly talking about the Edomites. And it's and it's just very interesting to me. Uh, but anyway, but Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. If God is the one who sets all things in order, and Esau was born first, and God makes no mistakes, how does Jacob get to usurp the plan of God? I've never thought about that before. I think I just had that thought for the first time. I like it. I like it. But that is very interesting. It's very interesting to me. How does how how is Jacob a good guy in saying these words? Like like at this moment, like Christians throw a fit when you do anything that they think goes against the plan of God. God planned that baby. God wanted it to work out this way. You know what I'm saying? And so if Esau was born first, didn't that mean God wanted him to be born first? Didn't that mean God wanted him to be uh, to have the birthright? And does this not now mean that Jacob is altering the plan of God if God, in fact, does have a plan? Or maybe he didn't have a plan until Jesus. I don't know. I'm sure you'll let me know in the comments. But no, it's just very odd to me here that, that Jacob is that Jacob says these words and that none of us say, holy crap, this is a bad guy. He, he's trying to go against God's order. Which is what he's doing here. He's going against the order of God, you know, at least according to many Christians. Um, now, to me, I can't find any order in God. So I don't know. You know, God seems to be pretty damn out, pretty much out of order to me. You know, it's like it's like a machine, you know, like like a like a soda machine, you know, that 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 has out of order on it. Don't don't put your money in it expecting to get changed back. Ooh, bars. Right. OK, so. Esau said, uh, look, I'm about to die. So of what use then is this birthright? Boy, God dang. And Jacob said, first swear to me. So he swore an oath to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew and he ate and drank and got up and went on his way. So Esau despised his birthright. Now, I did just see something in that. Um based off of some narratives that were very popular when I was young, when I was young, I don't know how many of those narratives are actually true. And, and, I, and I've actually done some, some, some work in that area to, to, to try to get to get to some clarity here. Uh, but this story, while likely written long before the transatlantic slave trade does mimic a lot of the popular narratives about the transatlantic slave trade. In the sense that Esau does not value what already belongs to him. 
that Esau already has the value. And then somebody else, you know, has something that looks like something you want and you give up the value over something temporary. You know, uh, I remember when I was growing up, th 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 there was this popular narrative of, um, well, when, when the Europeans went to West Africa, they they were able to just give them trinkets and the people gave up their land and stuff like that. Now, of course, once you actually do some historical, um, some research, you find out that things are not that simple. And, 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 and while that may have occurred in, in, in certain territories, it was completely irresponsible to paint that as a wide arching uh, narrative. Um, as well as the idea that uh, this idea that that Africans sold each other into slavery um, was was that a thing that happened? Yes. But I think one of the things that people don't do is take a look at the fucking timeline. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this here. Y'all y'all going to hear me for a minute. Um, if you're talking about Africans selling each other in the 1700s then no fucking duh, they had already been subdued by the gun. But if you go back to the 1300s, when the Portuguese first arrived in Sierra Leone, okay? If you go back to when they arrived and you look at their notes, they noted what they saw in Africa and there was no such practice of slavery in Sierra Leone. And, and the Portuguese were not the only ones to write that. There were several Muslim scholars who said that the that in many places in Africa were the safest place you could be. I can't even remember the guy's name right now, but I have it written down somewhere in my notes um, because I read it, you know. And so th this narrative of Africans selling Africans doesn't exist until the Portuguese, the French, the British um, and the, 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 the Dutch, Belgium have come in. And have absolutely massacred people and turned people against each other. So, um, yeah, hi history narratives. But as far as that particular popular narrative of tribes giving up ultimately their rights to their lands, um, you, you do see that kind of mimicked here. Um, and then, uh, but it wasn't just said about Africans; it was also said about Native Americans that this this same thing. Uh, and again, that's how that's one of the ways you can identify that something is likely fiction or at least an over exaggeration or an over assertion uh, of something is when 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 you start to watch that pattern over and over again, because believe it or not, you know, things typically don't work that way. Now, if any of you are ever interested in engaging that conversation, particularly about African slavery, now that is something that I do have a lot of information on who and I'd be more than willing to share. All right. So so Esau despises birthright like that's that that's how that ends. Um, I could still preach that, man. I could still preach that. I yikes. I, and I mean that in a good way, because that in, 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 in true in true fashion with fables, there is a moral to this story, you know, but. In this sense, normally, you know, the fables I was used to, or at least I thought, I thought there was a good guy and a bad guy. There's no good guys and bad guys in this one. It's just life, which, oh, man, makes it even more appropriate, right? It's like it's not a good guy. It's not a bad guy. These are just two people who are living in the world they live in, and this other guy is like, fuck God's order. I want the birthright, and I believe this dude would give it to me if I, if you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's like a fable. But to be honest, all of human history is a fable. Bars, right? I know. I know. Now let me stop. All right, let's go to the next chapter. Isaac settles in Gerar. Oh, man. Okay. And I, okay, so let's, let's jump. Now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. All right, I, I want to I point this out. There's a famine in the land, and, and it, besides the previous famine in the land. So there's a famine during the time of Abraham. There is now a famine during the time uh, of Isaac. All right. Uh, hey, spoiler alert. There will also be a famine during the time of Jacob. Another spoiler alert. There will also be a famine during the time of Joseph. What you learn is that 
the, this particular family is good at getting stuff, not good at managing it, right? And it's actually Joseph is the first one in the family who figures out how to manage stuff. The first one. Like, and then all of a sudden they give they give Joseph credit for everything in Egypt as if Egypt wasn't there before his ass. Isn't that crazy? From the biblical story. But we'll, we'll get there. So, so there's famine. Uh, and the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt, to Egypt, stay in the land of which I shall tell you stay in the land. Okay. Yeah. So, so live for a time in this land and I will be with you and bless you for, for to you and to your descendants, I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath, which I swore to your father, Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven. And I will give your descendants all these lands and by your descendants, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Okay. I do want to stop here. Uh, well, well, hold on. Let me read the next part. Because Abraham obeyed me and fulfilled his duty to me and kept my commandments, my statuses and my laws. All right. So I just I just want to I, I want to point this out here. If you've already made this promise to Abraham, why are you having to make it again? All right. Because what, what that actually does indicate is that you can renege on your promise at any moment. The fact that you're having to restate this promise, because listen to what he says. He says, I'm going to do all of this for you because Abraham obeyed me and fulfilled his, his, his duty. What, what, then you're not doing it for me. You're doing it for Abraham. You've already told Abraham you were going to do this. This is already automatic. Why are we even having to have this conversation? Like, dude, arrogant much? Like, damn, I heard you when you told my dad what you were going to do. You ain't got to tell me. Now you're going to tell me and you're going to tell my son and you're going to tell his son. Like, God damn, we know who you are, dude. You know, I'm sorry. It's just aggravating to me when people just kind of like overstate what they're doing for you. That's aggravating. And like real talk, like that used to bother me about Christians in my life, um, especially since I grew up as somewhat of an orphan. Christians would tend to overstate what they did for me and, and, and would look like think that my like there is a lady who thinks she changed my life because she invited me to eat at her house one time. And her house was dirty. It wasn't like even fun being over. The food was good. Don't get me wrong. The food was great, but the house was horrible. I was terrified the whole time I was in there. I didn't want to touch anything. But I was fat, so I was going to eat that plate. I was going to do that now, you know. But everything else was just like, what? But this lady thought, you know, in her in her mind, in her mind, she thought that her inviting me over for dinner, like forever impacted my life. And and I, I hate to be like bison off of Street Fighter, but that was just a Tuesday for me. I've eaten at a lot of tables, okay? And I'm not a dog. You're not saving me by giving me a meal. What the fuck do you think I am? I'm not the lady that Jesus talks to. Like, like, wow. Right. But yeah, yeah. So, so dang, was that a rabbit? Yeah, that was one hell of a rabbit trail. All right. Um, yeah. So he, he does this. So then, so Isaac lived in Gerar. When the, when the men of the place asked about his wife, he said, she is my sister. Like father, like son, right? right? And God has no problems here, you know? For he was afraid to say, my wife, thinking the, thinking the men of the place might kill me on account of Rebecca since she is beautiful. Now, Abraham thought this about the men of the place, and Isaac now thinks this about the men of the place. I am starting to wonder if this is something that their family does, if that their family actually kills people for, for beautiful women. Because why else would you have this fear? Why would you have this fear unless this is something that you encounter regularly, right? I mean, it could just be me, but yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it's an unsubstantiated fear. And, we're, you know, surely the patriarchs of the faith wouldn't have unsubstantiated fears. So when, when, when the men of the place, okay, so she is beautiful. Now, it came about when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, this used to be my dude, king of the Philistines, looked down throughout a window and saw them. And behold, Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebecca. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, behold, she certainly is your wife. I saw the way you were touching her. Don't nobody touch their sister like that except for Abraham. See how I did that? 
Um, so Philistine looked down through a window and um, then, okay. So how is it that you said she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, because I thought otherwise I might be killed on account of her. Sounds like they're running the scheme again. It's the same scheme. Abraham, we saw Abraham run this scheme twice. Let's see if Isaac gets anything out of running this scheme. I didn't mean to rhyme, but I did it on time. I did it. I did it on purpose that time. Okay. So, and Isaac said to him, because I thought otherwise you killed me. And Abimelech said, what is this that you've done to us? One of the people might easily have slept with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. What the fuck is wrong with these other people? Like, there is no other group of people that, that see the world that way. That, that's how you know this is one-sided. There's no way the king of the Philistines would be like, oh, man, if we slept with your sister wife, oh, we'd all be so guilty. No, that's not how that would have went. But that, this is this is like obviously like retold wishful thinking type of thing. Yeah, they know if they sleep with one of us, then they have to answer to our God. Yeah, nobody believes that who doesn't believe in your God. So, no. And, and you do see that, like, you, you, within this story, they go to places who don't believe in Yahweh, but yet you have these people responding as if they believe in Yahweh. Oh, I knew that your God would be mad if you did this to me, and your God talked to me. And it's like, how your God talked to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, oh, God, it, it, it's aggravating at this point. So, so Abimelech says, Commanded all the people, he who touches this man or his wife will certainly be put to death. What? Like, so this man comes into your place and lies. And according to you, puts everybody in danger. And so you decide to protect that man. There's no logic here. There's no logic here. Have you ever heard someone t telling a story that you knew they were lying about because they are super duper inflating, inflating themselves? That's what's happening here. It seems like th this people group tend to be inflating themselves here. Um, so now Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundred times as much. All right, which is, a, which is a common theme in the Bible. Actually, Jesus told his disciples that none of you who have given up houses, lands, or wives for me will not reap 30, uh, 30, 60, and 100 fold of that in this lifetime. He did. He said that. He said that. Never happened. Did not, did, did not happen. According to, according to popular tradition, uh, Christian tradition, which is not history to be sure, but according to popular Christian tradition, all of the disciples died horrible deaths. So none of them reaped 100 times. But apparently, the way to get this reaping, you have to lie to somebody and run a scheme. If you run the scheme, you reap a hundred times. So Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundred times as much, and the Lord blessed him. And by the Lord, we mean Abimelech in this moment, right? So, and the man became rich and continued to go richer until he became very wealthy. Okay, so I have to acknowledge this. I have to acknowledge this. For people who say the prosperity gospel isn't biblical, I don't know what Bible you're reading. Because the, the, the only thing the prosperity, and, and I wasn't a prosperity preacher, by the way, but the only thing the prosperity gospel has done is taken the promises that God gave different people in the Old Testament. And made them relevant in the New Testament. Because this whole story so far about Abraham's life and lineage has been about wealth building. I don't see how you don't see that. How do you read the book of Genesis and not realize that this whole book is about the accumulation of wealth for Abraham's family? Abraham runs schemes, accumulates wealth, and the Lord blesses him. The very first time that Abraham was blessed by the Lord was when he had went and, cap, uh, and and rescued his cousin Lot and took stuff from those people that he rescued his cousin Lot from. And so it's interesting because now even thinking through it, every time God blessed Abraham, 
was right after Abraham stole from somebody else. It's like God really blesses the child that steals their own, huh? You know, so it's very, but, but so yes, the whole, the whole Abraham story is a story of wealth accumulation. You know, um, it, it's those of us who take Jesus. And I was one of those people. It's those of us who take Jesus and Paul and make them the central figureheads for the whole story. So then you now interpret the whole story through, through what you think they said, because almost everybody who said the prosperity gospel wasn't biblical are using what Jesus taught as the world when Christians don't just follow what Jesus taught. They believe the Bible is the word of God. And so in the same way they believe that what Jesus said was true, they also believe that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. That's Old Testament, right? Because they believe that the Bible is the word of God, you know? So, and I say that because I need people to understand that prosperity preaching didn't come from a preacher. It's a prosperity belief system, and it is older than the prosperity gospel itself, you know? The Catholic Church believed in the prosperity gospel, but nobody ever calls them prosperity preachers, right? Um, and actually, the prosperity preachers are not the ones that bother me the most, you know? Um, because when you actually, and I know y'all are going to get mad, but hey, it is what it is. We don't have to agree. But when you actually study the, the prosperity preachers' churches, guess what they have more of in their churches? More people who are doing financially well. Yes. Because those, the most people have never, you know, I've, I, I know the, I've, I was a part of this world. So, so I know, I know a few things that most people have only seen through sound bites. You know what I'm saying? No, no, like, like, no, I, I was a part of this world. And so, um, the prosperity preachers are not the ones that bother me the most. You know what I'm saying? They, they, they're not. Um, and anybody thinking that people are really out there giving their last to churches, you really don't know people that well. I'm telling you, that's not how it goes. There's not people out here really being duped by their churches. That's why I always point the problem out to be our superstition. Like, for example, there are many pastors right now in the pulpit who are atheists who can't be anything else because if they were, their whole congregations would turn against them and cannibalize them. This is true fact. True fact. Go check out the Carlton Pearson story. The man said one thing. This is why people keep on saying preachers are the one leading people astray. You don't understand the dynamics. If that's what you're saying, you do not understand the dynamics. It is not the preachers that are leading the people astray. The people are the preachers are slaves to the people. Otherwise, I'd still be pastoring just preaching truth. But you cannot preach truth in a church where people are separated from truth. So there was a preacher by the name of Carlton Pearson who decided that this idea of hell just didn't make sense and that this idea of a loving God with a hell couldn't make sense. And so he didn't become an atheist. He became a universalist. He became an inclusionist. He believed that the power of Jesus was so strong that it saved everybody. And that's what he preached. He believed he preached that Jesus saved everybody everybody and that everybody was saved there was no hell and the church the entire church turned their backs on him he was a mega pastor one day and lost his entire church the other day you understand like so it's not just preachers out here being disingenuous this is a group effort yeah, I, I didn't make it clear. But anyway, so yes, it's if you're paying attention to the Bible, the promise to the people who follow God is wealth. The only place that story changes is, is, is the Gospels. And even then, the story doesn't change because Jesus promises his disciples wealth. He promises them the same thing that Abraham has. Just because you didn't read that scripture doesn't mean it's not there. So, yeah.
Now, what you will find out about me, I am against disingenuousness in any shape, form, or fashion. And I, I recognize when it comes, a lot of people who have opinions about church leadership have never been in church leadership. And so you're, you're, you're like generalizing a whole slew of people that you don't know. And so you're thinking that somebody just took the Bible and tried to twist it. And it's like, no, they're teaching what they think is true. Like, God dang, why is that so hard to believe? You can believe that people believe a hell is real. But you can't believe that people believe that their God wants them to be blessed. You think that has to be somebody being disingenuous? Like, that is weird. I'm sorry. Like, that, that's, that's weird. You, you want, you know, so, but I do, I have found that to be true in a lot of cases that a lot of people judge the church by their misunderstandings. You, you weren't that involved. Stop lying. A lot of the things you claim to know about the church, you don't know. You know, like I, I'm for one, again, and I, maybe it's because I was a pastor. I'm against this idea of people saying, well, pastors are stealing money from people. No pastor is stealing money from anybody. Those people are giving their money willingly. Stop that. You're making people victims who are not victims. They're participants. All of them. In a mega church, his salary has to be approved by the board. He don't just get to say, this is how much I, I make. No, he does get to pick his board, but so does everybody else. And so, no, let's not be disingenuous with stuff like that, you know, unless you're mad at all wealthy people. Now, if you're mad at all wealthy people, hey, you're being fair and I get it. I, I get it. <laughs> but anyway, so he, look, literally richer, continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy, you know, for he had possessions um, for he had possessions of flocks and, and herds and herds. Why do I do that? And herds and a great household so that the Philistines envied him. Now, I want to point something out to you here. And, th and this is how I this is this is why I'm so passionate about these type of dichotomies. As many times as I had read the Bible, that had never stuck out to me before. Not until 20, I think 2015 was the first time that it stuck out to me. And it only st stood out to me then because somebody else pointed it out to me. Uh, it was actually the first time I did this co-preaching. I'd never co-preached before. <laughs> you know, it's a thing sometimes. But uh, my, my mentor at the time. Um, this was and this was my mentor didn't know it fully, but I was an atheist at this time because I had stopped pastoring. But my mentor wanted me to stay a part of the Christian environment. So, he, you know, he wanted me to come and, and be on staff at his church. And so me and one of the other associate pastors, associate ministers or whatnot, we co-preached in, in, in our mentor's absence. It, very weird. Right. But um, and this was this was the, the message that we co-preached. And I realized that my version of the Bible and my version of the word and my understandings of God were never this prosperity God. And so because of that, when I read, read verses like this, I didn't see that. I didn't. When I read chapters like this, I didn't see any of that. But then when, when we got assigned to preach this scripture and I was like, oh, snap. Cause, and it was supposed to be like a, a I think it may have been a giving giving series at that time yeah that was we uh, but but i saw it and i was like holy snap so this is how other people get a different version of god than i got and 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 that's that's and that's the thing that's why i say it's kind of disingenuous when you tell somebody that oh you couldn't have got that from the bible because I'm, I'm thinking like the one thing that we know as atheists or at least that i thought we all knew but you know that's not really what atheist means but you know, I thought the one thing that we kind of knew is that this Bible can be twisted in any way. It's not telling a univocal story. So so when someone pulls something out of it that doesn't match what you pulled out of it, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily being disingenuous. Because I remember reading these scriptures not really paying attention to the wealth aspect. But then there are other people who read those scriptures and was like, yeah, that's the blessing. 
Like I, I read Genesis, you know, chapter one and two, where God is saying, you know, be fruitful and multiply, take dominion. And, and I didn't take anything authoritative from that. Because fiction really is in the eye of the beholder. Right. And so, yeah, so if some people choose to take this fiction and make make and, and, and make people want to be better financially. I'm not necessarily mad at that. I can be mad at the superstition. I can be mad at the things that are wrong without making things that are not wrong, wrong. That, that, cause that's weird for me. And, 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 you know, I don't know, like, uh. but yeah, so somebody saying God wants you rich. I don't see how that's a bad thing. God wants you in hell. That's the bad thing, but it's like, Oh, God wants you rich. Oh no, that's horrible. Don't preach that. Yeah. I pick my battles, I guess. Uh, I stayed on this too long, right? Uh, so now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up stopped up by filling them with dirt. So back in wells. And remember I told you wells were important through this story. Abraham dug some wells. Isaac has found these wells, and he's found that the Philistines stopped up these wells, which I'm not sure why. Like, we all need water. So I don't know why the Philistines would stop up the wells unless they had kicked Abraham out of this land and didn't want his family ever coming back again. And was just like, you know, what? just close the wells down so they can't get any water when they come. You know, I don't know. Like that, but that is that is an odd thing for a somewhat progressive civilization to do is like we're, we're going to we're going to stop the water. And, and you know, like just as a. As a random thought, I'm thinking maybe they they didn't st they, they didn't stop up the wells per se. Maybe they just blocked the top wells so they can run new irrigations. You know that's a possibility. But that is odd. You know that the Philistines just are out there filling up wells with dirt. That seems counterproductive. You know, counter counterintuitive even. Uh, then Abimelech said to Isaac, "Go away from us, for you are too powerful for us." Really, mind you. Uh, Isaac is not a nation yet. The Philistines are a nation. They have a king. And they're like, this, this, this goat herder is, is, is too, what? He's too strong for us? You remember that thing I tell you, you can kind of tell when someone's exagger exaggerating their own story? Going on, go away from us, you're too powerful, you know? So Isaac departed from there and camped in the valley of Gerar and, and settled there. Wait a minute. So Isaac lived in Gerar. Y'all see that, right? That's verse 26. Isaac lived in Gerar. Yeah. So Isaac went to Gerar. Verse 1. So verse 1, Isaac goes to Gerar. Verse 6, Isaac leaves in Gerar. Leaves Gerar. Uh, then when we, we're down here somewhere. Oh, yeah, it's close to here. And so then Isaac leaves there and goes to Gerar. What? Maybe it's just me. So then Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the same names which his father had given them. Now, this was preach worthy. That part by itself. Then Isaac dug again the wells of water, which had been dug in the days of his father. We would preach stuff like this for revivals because it's that's what it is. You, you, we're digging again the wells, you know, like we're going back and redigging the wells of the forefathers of the faith. Oh, man. Oh, there, there was. Ooh. You know, and it, and it really got people riled up. Oh, we're going to dig again the wells. And then in my latter years, in my early years, I was just a preacher preacher. So which means I, ju I just preach. But in my uh, my latter years, I begin to appreciate the performance of preaching. And man, and a, a good person to, to hear talk about this, oddly enough, is John Goodman. John, am I saying his name right? I think so. John Goodman, he plays Eli Gemstones in The Righteous Gemstones. If you haven't watched The Righteous Gemstones, what are you waiting for? Um, but he does a few interviews where he talks about what he, a lot of the stuff he learned about preaching. 
um, preparing for that movie. And, and one of the things he says that I absolutely agree with him on is that preaching is an underappreciated art form, you know? And he is absolutely, he's absolutely right. There, there is an art form to it. There is a performance to it. And I get when people say, oh, I don't like this. Well, of course, some people don't like rap. Some people don't like country. Some people don't like jazz. But just because you don't like something doesn't mean it doesn't have any relevance, right? Um, and so, you know, I definitely uh, fell in love with the, with the art of preaching as I became a pastor. Uh, which was before I became a pastor, I wouldn't even allow myself to believe that there was a such thing as an art of preaching. There's no art. It's just anointing. Uh, but as I begin to allow myself to mature, I was like, no, this is not this is not different than than any other type of public uh, elocution. This is not different than any other type of public performance. You know, um, you, 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 you if you want to be good at your craft, you have to work on refining your craft. You have to practice some things you have to. Uh, research some things. You have to learn other people. You have to learn how to appreciate other people who do what you do well. Yes, this is 100% an art form. The only problem is we're, 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 we're conveying our art on fiction Why not while not telling you it's fiction. That's the problem, uh, but not the art form itself. But, but yeah, so I, I would have definitely preached this and in my creative days, which is what I definitely became in those last 10 years, Oh, man, I would have like turned the stage into a sand pit and would have had some shovels up there on the stage so that I could really drive the point home. Oh, we're going to dig today, y'all. Oh, we're going to dig our way. Come on now. We oh, we would have had such a good time. I wish somebody out there would grab a shovel. Oh, oh, I'm spitting and everything. We would have had a oh, man, I would have preached this crazy. I, I kind of want to do it just for old time's sake now. Oh, man, I'm. Ooh. I'm tempted. Like, would it be wrong of me to like pretend like that I was a Christian again to, to just to be able to preach one more time on a good stage and then just preach it really good? And then at the end of the sermon, say, hey, by the way, I didn't believe any of that. You know, I think that would be the most honest message ever preached, you know, because the truth of the matter, people do enjoy the stories of, of, of the church. They enjoy the fabulism of the church. Um, and I don't think that necessarily has to end. I just think as long as we know we're suspending our disbelief, it's not a problem. So when we go watch movies, it's not, we don't mind participating with uh, participating with the make believe. It's just like at some point you have to understand, OK, like, hey, this is make believe. OK, uh, like even school spirit stuff like that's not exactly religious. Right. But come on. Haven't you had some people who like took it a little too far? And you was like, hey, there's really nothing wrong with having school spirit. But damn, you're aggravating the fuck out of me. And I, I wish you'd stop. I think you've taken this too far. I don't like this fucking school that much. You know, like that type of thing. And that is one of the things that I do. That, that And, you know, and I know this may bother some people, but one of the things that I do try to do is to humanize our understandings of religion and religion act, and religious activity. Um, because it's actually not separate separated from any other activity we have. You know, these are just these labels that we've created. But our religion is no different than our politics. Our politics are no different than the way we relate to sports. Some people have entirely superstitious reasons of why they're Democrats or Republicans or independents for that matter. Some people have entirely superstitious reasons why they support uh, Alabama over Auburn, you know, or whatever the big two is where you are, you know. So, you know, I, my goal in a lot of ways is to humanize a lot of this stuff so we can just get all the ghosts and goblins out of here and realize there were never any ghosts and goblins that this is literally all us. So being mad at God over the Bible makes no sense because he doesn't exist. When I find atheists who are mad at God, it sometimes like troubles me because I'm like, but he doesn't exist. How are you mad at something that doesn't exist? You know, like when people, people think I'm mad at God and I'm like, no, I'm, I'm completely indifferent to the, to the idea of a God. Like completely. It's a character that I can do with whatever the fuck I want because it doesn't exist. That felt good to say it that way, too. All right. So Isaac digs again. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of flowing water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac, saying the water is ours. So he named the well Esek because they argued with him. Don't, don't know why we're fighting over the water. You know, then they dug dug another well and they crawled over it. And I've preached this as an atheist. 
I think that was that had to be 2015. Um, then they dug another well. They quarreled over it, so they named it Sitna. Oh, yeah, this is about Rehoboth. Then he moved away from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it, so he named it Rehoboth, for he said, at last the Lord has made room for us, and we will be fruitful in this land. This whole story is troubling, right? Because you had a land and you left your land. Like Abraham has land. Why are you here now? Oh, because you mismanaged your land and your land is in famine. And so you mismanage your land and then you go to these other lands and it's like, well, these are actually my lands because my daddy used to be here too. You know, and then you fight and you fight and you fight. And I'm guessing you finally get to a place where you don't have to fight anymore. And you're like, oh, the Lord has made room for us on somebody else's land. Like, what the heck? Go back to your own land, dude. Yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. But and then also Rehoboth, fun fact about that. Um, I went to a, a, a elementary school named Rehoboth in uh, well, uh, elementary and middle. And I'm not allowed on that school campus to this day. I haven't, I haven't been there since seventh grade. I think that was the last time I was at Rehoboth. Um, seventh, was it seventh grade? Yeah, yeah, because I, I was there in fourth grade as well. But but I got kicked out for for causing a riot at the school. And, and, it, and, it, and it wasn't actually a riot. It, they were afraid of a riot. Um, but they called it a race riot when actually there were more white people participating in it than black people because the black people were terrified to participate. And, and just to be... Like I wasn't, the school's mascot was like literally a rebel man with the Confederate flag with a whip in his hand. That was the school's mascot when I was a kid. Yes. Yes. And honestly, that wasn't the only school in this city that had the rebel and the Confederate flag as his mascot. Right. And so as I'm, as I'm coming into being and understanding what these symbols mean, I was, oh, no, no, that, that's not cool. And this school had made rules. This school that has the Confederate flag as its mascot with a rebel man with a whip had determined that wearing shirts with Dr. Martin Luther King or Malcolm X were incendiary and you were not allowed to wear those shirts. Hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. So I got together a few few friends of mine and we wore shirts with NWA on them. There were no rules against that. And funny, like it was the majority of my white friends who ended up supporting that um that particular movement. But it got me kicked out of school, uh, none the least. Um but you know, like you know, again, just to share one of my, one of my stories. Uh, I can remember in seventh grade, sitting in classroom, hearing jokes made about black people. Like, and I, I can remember the jokes. Like, I, I can remember the jokes. What's the difference between a black man and uh, a large pizza? One can feed a family of four. This joke was told in a classroom of students. The teacher is there. Sweet lady, she's just as nice as she wanted to be. Younger lady, snickering along with the joke. The kids who told the joke didn't get in trouble. The environment that I grew up in was 100% dismissive of black identity. You know, and I was one of the, I stood up against things that my own family refused to stand up against, a part of my disgust for Christianity comes in watching what it did to my family. People who I barely want to call family today because I am so disgusted at what they have become. Yeah, that's my truth. Ooh, Wusa. Call a young Van Zant or something. Because that is my truth. I'm I, I was disgusted by, by much of the people that I grew up with because they wouldn't stand up for right. When I realized that the majority of the advice that came from my family members were coming from fear, I'm sorry. Other people, you, you should be empathetic towards that. I couldn't be empathetic towards that and, and, and not change. What? No, this, this stuff is disgusting to me. 
Um, so yeah, that was Rehoboth. And he went up, <laughs> he went up from there to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him that the same night and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. He's already talked to God. We, we remember we talked about that in the last chapter because I was like, Why are you telling me what you've already told my dad? You've already made this promise. Why why do you have to if you made a promise that's supposed to last for generations, why do you have to remake the promise every generation? And in the same way, if you've already had a conversation with God, why is God, I am the God of your father, Abraham? At this moment, it does make me feel like these are several different gods playing tricks on me. Because the fact that I got to tell you who I am, that means there's something different about me this time. Oh, Grandma, what big, big eyes you have. You see what I'm saying? Oh, no, no, it's me. It's me. I'm the God of your father, Abraham. You know, I just look different this time, but I'm him. You know, this is very odd. And, and saying the same thing, do not fear. I'm with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants, blah, 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 right? So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. I remember as a child not understanding what the word pitched meant. And it was just so weird, like, what is pitched meant? Pitched his tent. What? How, what is that? Uh, and mind you, obviously, I didn't grow up in a camping environment. Of course not. I'm black. And that's a generalization. There are plenty of black kids who did get to go camping and stuff when, when they were young. They're, you know, everybody doesn't live in the hood. I did, though. Covenant with the Bimelech. Then Abimelech said, uh, came to him from Gerar with his advisor. Uzzah. The place strategy is all over the place because Isaac leaves Gerar to go to Gerar and then Abimelech leaves Gerar to come to Gerar. What the fuck is going on here? Isaac said to them, why have you come to me since you hate me and, is, and have sent me away from you? They said, we've seen. Plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said an oath must now be to t taken by us, that is, by you and us. So let's make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you. And have done nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. Then he made them a feast and they ate and drank. In the morning they got up early and exchanged oath. Then Isaac sent them away and left them in peace. This story makes no sense. They had already sent you away in peace. And literally, he just says it. He said, just as we have done nothing to you and we sent you away in peace. Like, what are we doing here? This this is, what? What? Oh, God. I, I hate it these days of reading these kind of stories. Now it came about on that same day that Isaac's servants came in and told him about the well which they had dug and sold to him. We have found water. So they called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Now, that is interesting. When Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Biri the Hittite, and Basimoth, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. Do you see that? Now, we're going to end right here. We're, we're going to end right here. But do you see that? This whole, we had read two chapters that are ultimately about Isaac. And then you get to the end, and then all of a sudden, by the way, Esau marries somebody too, and they have children, and they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. One of the things that I ask people to pay attention to in Scripture, and we're pretty, we're still early in the book. We're just in chapter 26 of Genesis, you know, well, we're early in the book of the Bible, um, but, but we're still early. But so far, there is a pattern that is not, it's not been broken, and that is brother against brother that pattern we've not delineated from that pattern Cain and Abel Noah's children Abraham's children Isaac and Ishmael Isaac's children Jacob and Esau and now we're still continuing that pattern of Esau's children or Esau and his wife, or Esau and his family, bring in grief to Isaac and Rebekah. How anybody could read this book and think that this is a unifying story, you're not paying attention, right? 
because actually, at least in the context of the Christian Bible, right? Uh, and, and I have to say it that way because sometimes people say the Old Testament is the Hebrew Bible. And I don't think that's an accurate way to say that, you know, like, don't do that. But the Old Testament is the Old Testament of the Christian Bible. It's been reworded in that way. It's been re restructured in that way, organized that way, and presented in that way. And so I don't want to assume that, I, that I'm being faithful to the Hebraic story when I'm talking about my understanding of the Old Testament. But, but for my understanding of the Old Testament, it's division all the way down. It's division all the way down. You're basically talking about how a people have divided amongst themselves and have never been able to unify again. You're talking about this family that, that was supposed to be one family that was never able to be one family. And the only time this group of people are ever unified is when they are slaves in Egypt. And the moment they have their freedom, they begin dividing against each other. And again, it's division all the way down. So much so that by the time you get to the New Testament, the children of Israel are no longer recognizable. And all that is left is Judah. Which is how you get Judaism. You know, uh, which is something that I do try to highlight to people and try to bring out like. I don't think it's fair. To determine what. Israelitism is based off of Judaism. Anybody ever thought about that? That if there's supposed to be 12 tribes, why are we only taking one tribe's perspective? You know? But those are things you become concerned about when you actually want to understand the cultural context of what you're reading. Just realizing like, oh, yeah, this is, you know, basically the Old Testament is this book that tells you how we go from Hebraicism to Israelism, Israelitism, I don't know, to Judaism, you know, and, and that's really what a lot of those stories are, are about of this justification of why the kingdom of the South and the kingdom of the North separated, you know. And so by the time you get to the, the New Testament, you, you, you are literally solely focused on a Judaic, on a Judaic worldview, or at least that's what it's trying to make you think. Now, obviously, we know that, that by this time, this is a Greco-Roman worldview as well. But how much of the Judaic worldview can you separate from the Greco-Roman worldview? And I mean, and especially when you actually start looking at the, the differences that the Bible itself is trying to ex assert and, and these asserted differences that you begin to see are these differences between the ones who, well, it's, it's like the ones who, who uh, integrated. You see this integration of faith and, you know, which, of course, we end up either calling progressive revelation or the evolution of God. And so God in the Old Testament is a bad guy in the New Testament. He's a good guy, you know. And, and really what it is, is it's just this, this concept of God is being allowed to grow as you are integrating with other people. And this northern kingdom didn't like the way the southern kingdom was integrated. And so it's just division upon division upon division. But the proof of that is that's the fruit of Christianity. The one common fruit of Christianity is division. You do not have a unified church. Nor has there ever been a unified church. Even as recently within the past 10 years, a new Christian denomination has sprung up. And that will continue to be the case because the whole, the whole story is division all the way down. Thank you for hanging out with me today. I, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope I've said something that, that, Gives you some insight, makes you think about something, makes you say, ah, ah, maybe not, maybe ha, aha. That's what it was. I was going for aha. I'm not a dentist. I don't want you to say ah. I'm not that interested, you know. But no, this has been a great time. I think we, 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 this has been Bible study, right? We'll pick up next, uh, next time with chapter 27. Let's see what 27 is about. It's going to go and get a sneak peek. 
Jacob's Deception. Hell yes, I'm going to enjoy this. I might, if I can find um, the preaching clips of when I preached this at The Rock, I might see if I can find that because I, I, I definitely remember preaching this. Um, but yeah, so this was fun. Hey, don't forget to like the video. That's kind of important. Um, if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, I really don't know what you're waiting for. You know, hit the uh, hit the little notification bell because then you get notified. Uh, consider joining us on Patreon or our YouTube membership program. We're building these things out. Hey, and, and I really do need some volunteers. So consider going to my website, dldd.us. If you're serious about building secular community, we need your help like, for real, because like, you can't just build this around one person, one ideology, one identity. That's that's not healthy and that's not what I want to do. So I want as many hands and heads at the table as possible. Right. And and, I, and and we also want to be able to support other channels and create these bridges that really make the secular community even stronger than it already is. So really consider volunteering and check out the merchandise. Um, I think that's all I have for, for now. So until next time, keep rising. Stay progressive, stay beautiful, if you can.